Um, thank you so much for coming out to Wilson's exhibit. Um, uh, my name is Cheryl Benali. I am the program assistant for the Navajo Cultural Arts Program. This is our first annual, well, our first exhibit that we're doing, and in honor of Wilson O'Ronnell Jr. Um, this display here is in honor of Wilson. Uh, the display here that we have is displaying current students of Wilson, former students, and Wilson's bridal exhibit that he have that he has made. Um, so, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm nervous. So, what our program does is. It gives us, um, students the opportunity to engage in silversmithing, weaving, moccasin making, and basketry. So we're really, really excited for this exhibit that we are hosting. Um, I'll give the floor to Wilson now. Oh, yeah, it's a great place to go. It's a great Um... Contemporary Navajo, they're kind of well educated. They say, Yat Ehe means hello. No. If you look in the Webster dictionary, look up the word hello, it has an entirely different significant meaning. But if you understand your Navajo language, when you say Yat Ehe means, um, my, you look so brilliant, fantastic, and intelligent. There must be some creator that's really intelligent to create you like just the way your self-image and your self-identification is to, to put together. And the way you look is custom-made for you. That's what Yat Ahay, Nishon that's an old, I guess, language that I used to hear one time. It's an honor for me here to be here. Like my name was mentioned. My name's Wilson Ronald Jr. We have a Navajo clan that's highly important today. I'm originally from a place called Cliff Rose Creek, New Mexico, but better known as Tojalina, New Mexico. That's why I was born and raised, and even though I had a mother and father, I was raised by my grandmother, and then through... My, sort of like my traditional marriage, I came from New Mexico into Arizona, a place called Wheatfield, just uh, that chapter house just east of there, up in that little mesa, that's where my wife was from. And that's where I was taken, got married to my wife, been married to her 66 years. This past year, June the 23rd, we reached our 66 years anniversary. I always tell my people, Friends, even my students, just to be honest, my married life wasn't jolly and sweet and lovable. In my life, we come to a conclusion that we weren't really compatible. So we had to sit down together and roll a mountain sacred tobacco and compromise and put our bad habits aside, both of us. Then we, we came out of it. Okay, so that's how we made it this far. And also... I did have four children, but going on almost 15 years, I lost the youngest son, which was one of the most devastating part of my life. And then uh, with that, the children that I have, I have grandchildren and then great-great-grandchildren today, which is a real beautiful experience and I guess one of the most highest blessings that individual could ever ask for today. Anyway, that's my introduction. And... I guess um, I would not say out of coincidence or anything or anything like that because in Navajo knowledge, there is no such thing as out of coincidence or anything like that. It has to be honestly and truthful. So one day I went to work for Navajo Community College in 1968 to make my story short and 
I received a memorandum from Nanta Kangati the fall of 1968. And I went over there that morning. I was kind of scared because I, I figured maybe I wasn't qualified. I was hired as animal husbandry assistant. Uh, took care of a lot of livestock. But anyway, when I went to his office, he says, do you know anything about novel knowledge or arts and crap? I said, no. And that's that past Sunday, about 10 o'clock, I had five students that came to the barn where I was getting things ready to feed my livestock. And I told him, these are some of the animals that are kind of mean, be careful, kind of assist them there for a while. And Went back to the barn. I was in there trying to get everything all organized to feed the livestock. And they came into the barn about maybe about 11:30, close to 12, close to 12 o'clock. And it was snowing. And they said, "Hey, sir, Mister, do you know anything about horses?" A little bit. Okay, I said, "Can you tell us a story?" So I recorded it on rail-to-rail -rail tape recorder for about 45 minutes. And then the young lady again said, do you, do you know anything about horse song? I said, a little bit. Can you record it? And I did that. And it so happened that young lady was Nan Hattati's daughter. So the next day that memo came, and when um, Nan Hattati interviewed me about if I knew any knowledge of Navajo knowledge and all that, arts and crafts, I said, no, I don't know, nothing about it. And he reached into his drawer and took out that table cord and he said, is this you? Well, I couldn't lie. I said, yeah, you know something about novel knowledge. We have about three class. Even the medicine band, they know ceremony, but they don't know how to teach the value and the, the protocols of novel knowledge. I, we need your help. I think you know something about it. And then somehow he found out. But that's, so that's how I teach in novel knowledge, that they... And he said, um, I told him, I never went to school to be an educator, Mr. Hattati. He said, I'm not asking if you did that. You go ahead and teach Navajo knowledge the way you were taught. So it was a tremendous, tremendous challenge for me. And then from there, he found out and knew a little bit of uh, silversmith. And so then I went, I became a silversmith teacher too for a beginner student and advanced student at that time. And then, then a tremendous Nice experience working with Kenneth Begay, and then there was another one, uh, another relative of mine that uh, we work. And they're all gone today. I'm the only one living. Well, anyway, it's honor to be here, and that's how I started um, being involved in artwork. It was a real nice, tremendous experience. I met all kind of different young people with different values to believe. And they always ask me, what in the world is the Navajo learning and education about arts, arts and craft? What is it? And I said, okay. To answer your question, I said, Navajo or the arts and craft is about your life. Your existence, who you are, where are you coming from? Your artwork identifies the uniqueness of your intelligent capacity, whether you believe it or not. I said, that's the way it is. It's all about the study and learning about life, your potential, your ability, and your capabilities. And I'll tell you the truth. You were born with artistic mind. My student, I said, you were born with artistic mind. You have the ability, potential to be creative in, in whatever way you want. And I said, also, novel arts and craft is about learning about the knowledge of understanding in terms of where you came from, why you are here today, and the direction where you're supposed to be going. And it is about the understanding of your values and belief and your purpose and understanding of your life. I said, Navajo arts and craft, silver work, is the learning to investigate the truth principle of learning that we have that relates to our living, which will help us to understand ourselves and why that there is a unique 
prosperity out in, in, in the life we're, that we're living. This, this art is going to make you connect with that prosperity to materialize and fr fruitfulize your life in a certain way. It's going to give you a real nice discipline to have self-awareness and you're going to have a greater understanding of your uniqueness and your ability. That's what I told them. So then I said, Navajo silverwork has a spirit that makes it a living, a living um, artwork, and we call it that's what I told them. Well, wow. So Navajo arts and craft, silversmithing is like the image and the uh, personality of your mother and your father, your grandpa and your grandma, and you're interrelated with it. That's the unique part of it, I said. I said, in that sense, you know, you, you can learn the understanding of some kind of special leadership that's going to balance your characteristic. And through your artwork, there's one thing. You can't be lazy. You can't be stubborn. You cannot condemn your artwork or get mad about it. It's, it's just like, like your mother and your father, like the teaching says, you should never tell your mother and father, brothers and sister to shut up or argue with them. You should never do that. The same way with your artwork, because it can give you a good behavior, attitude, personality, your own opinion, your responsibility, your desire to challenge something good. It can become your motivation, your interest, your desire, your comprehension. It can even really put your objectives and goals and your endeavors of life in order for you. I said, that, that's the way it is. And that's kind of like the way uh, I explained it to my student today. I still try to abide by that. Now, the reason behind that, jo e kot aap ne na e di peshle ke ichi to yeh ke e be sote zon holo be yin holo e be ko hamat eliyek e hajet eliyek e hajet eliyek e hamasan et eliyek e. Ebicho <laughs> That's the way I said it. And so based upon, I said, your sky. Don't pay it on what you cheat, don't pay shorts and it. I said, maybe the English translation is going to be so logical, but maybe I'll say it like this. The, the spirit of that white shell represents our feeling thought like into our intuition intuitive form, feeling and thought our conceptual perceptual part of our mind it stimulates the, our critical and creative thinking that's white shell that's how come it's sacred I said turquoise is the representation of your endeavor of life. Why you have to educate yourself. You got to be prepared. You got to plan out your life, your opportunity, the requirements in your life, how you will demonstrate your discipline to challenge, to learn, to 
to exercise your skills and your ability. So tear quotes can give you a good spirit and power and energy, motivation to be very enthusiastic. That's how you're going to educate yourself to be someone. You're going to have a good leadership. That's the representation of turquoise. That's a kind of was very important to our people. I said, so then I say, abalone shell represents our life process. There's a reason why you were born, right? You should be proud if your mother and father was legally married. They brought you into this world. And they're the one that can tell you why they brought you into this world. And then in some of our case, we weren't like that. Anyway, um, that's how come I was raised by my grandmother. And so that abalone shell represents your process of your birth. They say you only can be born once in your life, not twice. You only can be young once, not twice. So while you're young, challenge yourself. Don't do the easy one first. You know, get your act together. Do something that is tremendously challenging. And that's how it's going to develop your competency and self-sufficiency, self-reliance, self-esteem. And that's going to become the quality of your life and its outcome. That's what the chitta abalone shell represents. Then I said, Bashini e beta hutzel chito, beta na hutzel zito, cotta, hutish be dak etso, nasal, acho, eh, we etzen zenigi at a translation. I said, the black jet <clears throat> maybe isn't the proper type of translation. I said, black jet represents our self awareness, how we understand our safety needs, and how we um, understand and obey our natural law, and then to protect ourselves from harm, evil, and danger, bad solution, bad substance. That's what black jet represents. That's how come we have an arrowhead, a sweat house, bow and arrow, a lance and a shield. That's how come we have protection, prayer, and song. I said, that's affiliated with black jet. I said, then we have red coral. Your chi chi is our blood flow and the blood float we're coming from. That's how come our blood float is sacred. They say keep your blood, your red blood, your white blood cell, your blue blood cell, your glittering black blood cell, clean, pure, and healthy. Uh, don't add something. Don't give it away. Don't sell it. Don't donate it. Your blood is sacred. That's what red coral represents. I said. And then the silver best okay, silver Silver represents our personality, our attitude, and it shields us, it protects us, it takes care of us, it watches over us. They said, so come, even if you just wear a silver bracelet, just silver, it's your guidance, it's your protector. And then I said, there's um, a Tsitsui. Uh, then they call it Ola which is gold. We had that. That gold represents our behavior, character, and discipline. And then we use that sacred fire, but today we use propane bottle. It's the same thing, that fire caught the key. So that fire, we call it grandpa fire, grandma fire, and it represents our ethics to obey and to control our life. That's what that represents. And then we use water. We call that water almost like a mother and a father, a spirit. And water of life gives the strength and it oxidizes and cleanses our essence and existence of life. It keeps our life clean and strong. But we use it in an art work. And then the last one is air, like buffing machine runs by air. They call that grandpa, grandma. 
And so that air it's our breath of life. It's our purpose why we're here. We have a breath of life. So when you look at it like that, our arts and crafts, silversmithing, the knowledge, it's a living artwork. Okay? And then I, then I said, our Navajo mind is like an artwork, meaning, the spirit of our Dene mind is the power of our feeling and thought. Now, our feeling, eh? Be. That one is in form of a female. Our feeling is in form of a female. And it's special. That's your thought. Your thought is in form of a male. So there's duality. You have to put your feeling, your thought to balance your mind to understand your creative intelligency to understand, communicate with your artistic mind. That's what I learned. I wish you could understand Navajo good. I don't have to use English language, but in, per in terms of education, I'll go ahead and do the best way I can. So in that sense, they say your thought is the picture of you. You have the duplicate in your thought and your feeling, your mind. There's a duplicate. So when you do your artwork, you use your thought. And you come up with a nice picture, a good design, and you put it into motion, it comes out beautiful. And then your feeling is your scenery and your surrounding. Our people, Navajo, a long time ago, they would look at the scenery like rock weavers, like my grandma done that. And they, that's where you could visualize and there's some kind of symbolic symbol pattern out there, and you use your feeling to get that, to communicate. You put it together. Your feeling becomes your artistic way to form something, to structure something. Then your thinking is like your paintbrush, so to speak. Your thinking is like in silver work, your ball pin hammer, your stamping tool, your right height mallet, your steel ruler, your scriper, they're like your family. They said, don't let me borrow your hammer. Let me borrow your ruler. Don't say that. Get one of your own because you can adjust to that. And that's going to be your thinking. You can work with it. You can know the way, how it's going to balance, how to come up with a good design. So that's your thinking. Your mind is your paintbrush of different colors. Your mind will somehow balance what you're doing. It's going to put all the design colors, whatever's going to be, all together when you finish. It's going to be brilliant. That's what I was, you know, uh, telling my student. Anyway, I'm going to share about that much with you in terms of um, uh, some of the values and belief of what I learned from my grandfather. His name was Achiti Tzwoe. And also he has a name was Hasti Tlunz. And that was my grandmother's youngest brother. He was Kishichitni. My maternal grandpa, Ada. Anyway, <clears throat> um, he used to do silver work away from a home, Hogan, way over here all by itself. He had a duck out, real fixed, real nice. And sometime he would invite me. He said, I want you to just look. I'm not going to try to hold your hand, explain, or draw, it or come up with a design for you. You've got artistic mind. Just look. When you look, learn to breathe. Learn to breathe correctly. Look. And that's how by breathing and by watching, listen to 
the ball pin hammer, all that, his movement, his gesture. That's how I learned. Just a little bit of it. And one of the outstanding ones that I've seen him make was a traditional horse bridle. And when I think about it, it makes me cry. My gosh, I think. How can our people be very artistic? And I learned it, and I was kind of honored. Then the young lady that introduced me, and then also my boss, Christina Army, said, we're going to ask you a favor. Maybe you could say no. But it's going to be for a good cause. We want you to make a novel traditional bridal, everything. I said, okay, then it's right here. And I have to go back to my grandpa. The last time I made something like that was 1960. A large one and a medium sized one. And there was an <clears throat> art show in La Hoya Jewelry in San Diego. And then at 21, 29 Pond Spring, they had a big art show. That's where one of my nephew and one of my brother in law, we wanted to took our jewel over there. And when I displayed it early in the morning, there were some people, white people. They looked normal. <clears throat> they looked poor. Here, this young lady said, how much do you want for that bridal? Then I told him my price. Uh, Fifteen minutes later, they all came back, and I, I didn't know they were rich. They had quarter horses and everything. So <clears throat> instead of um, giving me 5000 for that bridal, they gave me 8000 and then the other one, instead of giving me 3000 they gave me 6000 And I was shocked. I didn't know what to do with that money. And then I had to pray. And then I said, I better control myself. That's it. But my wife and I and my children used that money. We went to a special place. Overlook me, I don't know why I'm emotional. From that from nineteen sixty to today, the first time I made a bridal again, that was kinda of like an honor for me. It brought all what I did in my life all the way up to now involving artwork. Hey a cut yeah. So I Acknowledge my grandfather and my grandmother. Eddie could have a question that don't let me into question, don't let. I know yet. Um, the origin of Navajo silversmithing, according to my grandma and my grandpa, it, it came through the act of two twin warriors called Nayena Zan Tobachishin. To make the story short, they went to visit their father in this particular special kingdom, I guess, I won't, that won't sound right, but a place called Johanna Ebehogan, Dorkizhi, Bekin Tatkata Na Eh, Dorkizhi Bekhaz Eh, Yoskreshita Na Ha, What's the name of the place? They went to all kind of tests, but they won. Finally, their father said, you are my true children, my sons. What do you want? The story didn't say their father opened a door. There was no such thing as a door. 
until the Spaniards and Pilgrim European came. We had that sacred blanket in the interest of a Hogan. He said he, he opened that sacred blanket to the east, south, and then when he opened it to the west, that's where the holy people were doing all kind of craft work, metal work. That's where they came across what they called bestiches, 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 bestiches. That's where they found that metal. And that's where that technical skill of welding, soldering, how to do metal work, the holy people were doing that. That's where they, those holy people make that armor for them. So that's where the origin of our Navajo silversmith and the art work and everything come from. Then if you read the history, it came from the Spaniards too, yes. <laughs> That's that part. Now, uh, when I was kind of doing a little research in time when I came to work for the Naval Community College, today in the college, I was interested in Allison Crab. So I did a study, and then it says this. Uh, 1790 was the first time ever they found a Navajo man somewhere like east, south of Gallup, around Rame or somewhere, he did a horse bridle out of brass. Brass. They found that. They were trying to find out how in the world he made it or where he learned that skill. They didn't find out. The next one was Early 1800 fall, further down this way, uh, and almost in the area of St. John. But this was made out of nickel silver coin. Based on how long, I guess they melted it and got it to certain gauge, and they found that it was made by a Navajo. And then the next one was uh, 1820. That was made out of silver coin. It was melted and pounded out flat in the silver. And then if that's the way the story goes back. It identified our Navajo artistic people that knew silver work. And it, 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 we were in some history for compliment. So that's where we're coming from. I wanted to share that with you. Eh, Hotelo, I know you're there. When you talk about horse bridle, it really relates to a horse. I call, I used to always hear this growing up, and I was trying to remember and refocus how did it go, and then try to. Think about it and so forth. And finally, I think I kind of reconnected with this. It's a song. So I'm just going to sing the first um, line or the first set. How do you say it? The first, okay, structure. It's a long song. We might be here till midnight. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, when you say this, it's not just moaning and groaning, but there's some researchers, they say, when these Navajo, when they sing, all they do is moan and groan. No. When you say this, you're addressing Mother Earth, getting her permission to do something here. And then when you say, you're addressing the natural cosmic order, addressing that divine creation to let them know what you're going to do here. 
where there is prayer, but this is a singing. I got a cut out of I thought, and when you describe the the structure of the singing, it all has a significant meaning. And you know, behind it, the whole long, a hot air long, a At <laughs> At an Johnny Lepic, young pig, young hay, nay, oh, shea, low at an Johnny Lepic, young pig, young hay, nay, oh, a hatta honey, hatta honest chinny, pig shed, lock on, at an Johnny Lepic, young pig, young hay, nay, oh, a bestest or dear, pig cat, a la la, a la la go, Shabbat Shalom, Natsilatiya, Bezalat Olakom. 
Then you go to the South Mountain, the West Mountain, the North Mountain. But it kind of changes, but the same rhythm. But this is just the first verse. If you study the song, it's telling you the whole structure and pattern of how a horse was created. Now, um, I want to walk over here. Could you just uh, share something with you here at this time? My granddaughter, she's sitting here, an artist, her name's Chantal. She's a real good artist. She drew this for me. But they said, the whole body of the horse in the song, it said, Nestin, Wutta Itzos, Bitta Torpachatitin. It's made out of a horse body even inside the structure of a horse. And it said, the hoof is made out of and underneath it, the, for the male, there's a male arrowhead for the female. A female arrowhead. That's what the song is saying. And then they said, the, this one, this one is made out of male and field, female rain and zigzag lighting and straight lighting. The same way with the tail. And then the forehead right here is made out of chahatke, like folding darkness. Then hayotka, the dawn. And then their eyes is in form of that crystal called shai. 
That's how come they can see at night, like they can see you, they can see through you, they can see evil, witchcraft, something called disease coming, or some kind of destruction, something, war coming. They know it, they'll tell you. A horse is like your brother and your sister. That's what the song is saying. And then also the mouthpiece, Inside the tooth, the mouthpiece, is the image of white shell and abalone shell. And now, eh? Yos ke di chise, be bizad la tapeze ha ho jon. And then the lip, they call it yotso. Then its voice is the image of that reed. Look up, in there they go, hee 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 and then uh, the song says, this one here, the head, uh, the brow band, brow band, this one, is an image of turquoise. And then this one here, the headpiece, all this that comes down this way, is the image of white shell. And then this one is the image of Turquoise, turquoise, and the uh, ring is the image of sun ray and rainbow. And that's how they move. That's their power and energy. And that's kind of like the way, and then the bib here represents silver, that personality, awareness. And I, I kind of thought that that's the way I still remember from what I was told. Although my, my grandma and grandpa didn't drive me any kind of horse figure, but this is my mind. So based upon that, our natural Navajo knowledge comes in form of abstract, abstract knowledge. When you learn the abstract knowledge, all you do is listen and pick it up. It really sure. Then when you learn the ab that abstract knowledge, then you bring it and focus into concrete and then becomes visual. But today, it's vice versa. They're telling us that Navajo are learning visual and concrete. They're leaving out the abstract. That's a come. There's forgetfulness. We have to put everything in the computer. You see that? But if you follow the story and the song, it's still in sequential order relating to abstract knowledge. Then it'll focus into concrete and visual, even the song. That's my little story here today, and I guess I could all go on and on, but time is short, and, but I really... I want to thank all of you to be here, to acknowledge what my boss is trying to do. This is the first time ever I was kind of thinking like this. My gosh, these young ladies must have some time of real good thinking, <coughs> feeling, concern, because th this is the year we reached our 50 years anniversary in the college. And they said, how are you going to celebrate it? I said, we have an image of a corn stalk right there in front of this subconscious and right there. The image of corn stalk. It has six male corn cob over here and six female corn cob over here to represent the principle of 12 knowledge of our people, novel people that relates to our curriculum, stories, and teaching. And then um, that's what they call and it was planted here April the 13th, 1971. So based upon that, about 30 yards, like a circle, it's a sacred ground. And a lot of students, 
Some of the people don't even know we have a sacred ground. That's why they use the four Navajo clan creation prayer and song. So in order to celebrate our 50 years, I think we should thank that cornstalk and Tsa'anagavik Ahujon and Tsa'akis Nahat'a'i Nasi Hassan. Prayer and song. Don't thank me or try to give me gift. Give them gift. The next one is, when they sang the song, the song described it and indicates that when this institution is going to be built, the student is going to be the spirit and the blood flow and the personality of this institution. I think our professional people should butcher a buffalo or maybe a beef or sheep and bring the student here and say, thank you, you're the reason why we're here, and hug them, feed them. That's me. To be thankful, to celebrate our 50 years anniversary. Or maybe we could go out to one of our sacred mountain, sing a song, offer a prayer. That's always my feeling. But I'm not the boss, so I'm just at the tail end. But anyway... So based upon what took place just now, I think it was a good thing. I work here, taught this class 50 years, believe it or not. It was kind of like maybe it kind of correspond with the 50 years anniversary to say that here at the Net College, there's a beautiful arts and craft. And I had the privilege to, because maybe nobody wanted to do it, maybe they don't know, but I learned the origin story of rug weaving from my grandma, and she taught me some songs. I still remember about four of them. And then also the origin of moccasin making. It came from be named That's where it came from, that um, moccasin making the origin. Then it, it, it explains your sacred footprint. Like my grandma used to say, wear your moccasin at least twice out of a month. Don't wear these ear peen shoes because sooner or later you're going to say, my feet aches, my back, oh, because you wear the wrong shoes. Wear your moccasin. Then you're going to, have, you're going to be physically fit. You're not going to hurt. That's what she used to say. But when you say that, you sound like you're ignorant or prejudiced, huh? I don't know. Anyway, that's what, too. And then also a story about basketry, the origin. I had a privilege to share. It was a lot of students all these many years. I could go on and on. But I thought today... I'm not qualified for it anymore, so I'm going to go and just take care of my wife. That's what I think about. Some say, go another two years yet. I'm still thinking about it. Anyway, but I enjoyed every bit of it here, working here all these many years, all the way up to now. So thank you, um, Christine, your assistant. I always forget your name. I forget name. Thank you for this honor, and uh, really make me feel good. You know, even though maybe it don't look much, but to me, it's something that motivates me to still go on, keep going, and to uh, teach some of our youth, Navajo youth, to teach arts and craft. Maybe even they can even learn. I always say we should start a leather craft, a craft. We can make horse bridle. If they buy leather for us, they can even make bridal purses, something. It's there. Big the and then the nobody say, okay, we're gonna try it. Nobody says it. Ma, we still have some people that know this artwork. We need to pass it on to these little children, younger generation. I guess this, that was the whole idea. Anyway, there was some one commitment I heard when they know they donated this land here from the Kiaani clan. They said, okay, if you're really going to put Navajo knowledge here, so then the agreement says, we're going to 
protect, shield, foster, perpetuate, enhance Navajo language. We're going to hold on to that. And also, Navajo culture, knowledge, and values, Navajo philosophy, Navajo psychology, Navajo um, sociology, Navajo natural government history, knowledge, and, and then uh, uh, Navajo herbology, astronomy, Navajo traditional food, the prayers and song that used to go with it. Many others, we still have the opportunity. And so far, there's still about five or six type of knowledge missing yet. And so somebody has to say, hey, Board of Region, President, or educator, let's do this. But only if they listen to us, huh? I don't know. But I'm just way down there, nobody would listen to me. They're way hey, up there, way ahead of me. I respect them though, they're good people. Thank you. Any questions? Any question? Back at Huh? Oh. If it relates to food, <laughs> I've always adjusted myself to drink spring water. There's some spring welcome from that. Plus, if I got married, my wife always gets blue corn. She grinds it every morning. She feeds me that corn. Or she makes a bet bad masa. And then, you know, traditional food. Every, every once in a while, I eat tacos or hamburger. But I think it's the food that gave me the nourishment, the strength, and the motivation to go. So when you get married, if your wife is not lazy, she gets up four o'clock more cook, and you eat and pray, that's a good motivation. If you marry a lazy wife, Boy, you better be careful. You're going to have to cook for her and feed her in bed. I used to have a grandpa who said, don't you ever allow your wife to take off your shoes or your pants. Then when you've got no business being married. That was the teaching. These women are special. They're not something you abuse. So as a young man said, don't go over there and say, hey, that's evil-minded. Those women are special. But one day when you get married, live with only one woman. Don't go from woman to woman. No, I'm way off. <laughs> Ayla, number one. But along that, I think it's prayer. And like the song that I sang, traditional song, protection song, a little bit I learned, I guess mainly prayer song. And I think it's because of a beautiful respond attitude, behave personnel of the student I had. They never say, hey, Mr. Arnold. They say, Grandpa, or like, Uncle, my friend. Not exactly, but, hey, you're my in-law. Yeah, I'm ready to your wife. Okay. Now, I think that really motivated me. And I said, 
I'm not going to call you by name. I'm going to call you as grandkids or nephews, nieces. We're going to get along. And I think that's like a that keeps you going. It motivates you. And whatever class you take, that keeps me going. I'm still trying to think about it. Maybe if I sign the, uh, the contract, we'll go two more years. And now they told me I might have to teach in Tuba City and Window Rock. Okay, because some of our present people are retiring. Okay. Uh, so I didn't want to leave and leave like an empty hand. Hey, Ban Tananas Kiso, I have feeling for student. Maybe I'll stay again. Oh, no, no, that's my thinking. Oh. I guess the question was what motivated you to be here 50 years? It was food I eat, prayer, and believe and believe in what I'm doing, and my dedication commitment brought me this far. And I enjoyed every bit of it. There's a little criticism, I guess that's the way life is. But I always get along with my sister, my, I mean, my student, really good. Any other question? Did that horse song sound all right? <coughs> sound all right? I was kind of out of rhythm. <clears throat> because of my voice, I know I get weak. After I had blood transfusion, I'm not back to my voice and everything. Sometimes I get weak. I, I went to, I almost died. <laughs> the, year, the year 2015, I ended up in the hospital. But that happened. Okay. Thank you. Wilson. Uh, that concludes the lecture and question and answer um, for the title of Teaching Silversmith at Diné College. And of course, during this event, we are actually celebrating cultural arts teaching and of course, silversmithing with Wilson. Um, so we're thankful for the opportunity he has given us to hear from him. Um, now we were going to go proceed to uh, the gift presentation. So at this moment, I would like to invite Miss Eileen Nagel, um, weaving instructor and former student of Wilson here at Diné College. So if you want to make your way up, um, you can do your presentation. Um, Kachi Eya Wilson is going to receive a gift on behalf of Diné College from Eileen here. So. Yate che ya Eileen Nagel dashajana look until the nashado a ashagan. Ten you can in slow to not jinny bashashin. Kia ane dashache do. Navajo Cultural Arts Program uh, became a, a, a certificate program. And I said, yay, when I saw the weaving. So I went through the program. I was one of the, the first Navajo weaving student in that program. So I'm so happy. I, I completed it. And it's, it's really, um, it's, it's a lot of work, a lot of commitment. And I did it. I did it in uh, two semesters. And so throughout the Novel Cultural uh, Arts Program, we are required to um, do lots of weaving. And I was weaving like crazy during that summer. And so um, there was weaving we did for donations, weaving for presentations, weaving for um, other gifts. And at that time, I wove a rug and in one of my class, uh, Wilson was one of our speaker, and he spoke, um, and it just, uh, I just thought, 
Well, um, I want to do something that, that represents what he said. And also, um, he has this book here, Foundation of Novel Culture. He, he wrote this book. And in there, there's um, a message about the four directions. Therefore, I dropped it. I wanted, I wanted to present um, Chanela, mm -hmm. the four directions of the rug I wove, the eastern, right here, the southern, the western, and the northern, yeah. the four colors. I wanted you to have that because you did a lot of touching messages to us at that time, mm -hmm. and I appreciate it. All your your knowledge and and your wisdom that you've uh, presented to us in in our classroom, and it just means so much. The four colors and the four directions. It's all in this book. I always read this. I carry this, and I have this all the time with me. Shishanella, Although um, there's a lot of meaning and messages on the weaving, it's it's just so touching. Like the the beginning part here represents the four direction. As you start to weave, you honor your four directions when you first start your colors in. And I've learned that from many weavers and my own family, my mother, um, you always honor the four directions because you're always going around every direction, the four directions, every day. And then uh, the meaning of the colors, you always present that in, in everything you say. That's the four colors you always talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't already gone into the exhibit hall, there um, are displays of various in-cap um, artwork. So please make your way in there after. Um, also, we'd like to say thank you to several key um, contributors to uh, the sponsorship of the program tonight. So, of course, we want to mention Diné College, Kia'ani Library, as well as the Land Grant Office and the Center for Diné Studies. Uh, so feel free to check out the NCAP website. Um, it's linked to our Diné College um, overall college website. So um, please do that. And uh, now I would like to invite up um, Dr. Christine Ami. She's the grant manager for the Navajo Cultural Arts Program, and she will be providing us the closing remarks. Marks. Thank you, Winnie, and thanks, Wilson. Yeah, it's a donut national gear and Hachini national. I do Bilagana Bashin to Higini Dashinale. I do Bilagana Dashinale. It's nice to be here with everybody. Thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, it's actually quite impressive. It's our first event that we've hosted here at the R.C. Gorman uh, Library at the, uh, here in Salee. And I wanted to invite everybody to come in. We have tons of food, uh, so please help yourselves. Inside, I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, we have two types of jewelry showcased this evening. The first is obviously uh, Wilson's work. We have Wilson's commissioned bridal, which is absolutely amazing. Um, when, when we first approached Wilson for this, I didn't know what he was going to say. I was kind of thinking, Maybe maybe he wouldn't do it. I know it had been quite a while since since he had uh, made a bridal, but he decided that he he was going to take the challenge and and he showed up at our house at like seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I was still in my nightgown and trying to get the baby up, and I thought he was going to start yelling at me for for not being up earlier and not having ground my corn for my husband. And um, <laughs> but he was very kind and and he didn't say anything. He just entered the house and he said. Christine, I, I got an idea. Do you have paper? And 
I said, yeah, we have papers someplace. So I, I put my put the baby down and and we searched the house for some paper and we pulled out some paper and and there he drew out the plans. Um, he was like, this is what we're gonna do. I'm I'm re-energized. I'm motivated. I'm I'm ready to take on this challenge. Let's do it. And and that's what he did. He so he drew out the bridle and he says we could do this or we could do this. Now let's do this. And he scratched things out and and then he drew the chess piece and he talked about the whip and the significance of the whip and why we have to include the whip in, in, in that as well. And so that's what you're going to see in here. You're going to see those plans, those those exact drawings that he made on our kitchen table um, with the coffee. You never finished the coffee, Wilson, but uh, I don't know what that says about my coffee. But, <laughs> um, but those plans are in there, along with some of his demo pieces that he shows his students. Um, we have older pieces. I believe one of the oldest pieces that we have is, is dating back to 1960s, uh, Bogart, a beautiful b- butterfly Bogart that we have in there. Um, and some recent pieces that he's been working on with his son. He works a lot with his son now. And so that's what we're, uh, we have for, for you guys to take a look at. On the opposite wall, we have the bridal set. Um, it's there for you guys to, to enjoy and to marvel. And we're so grateful that you, you donated that and well, commissioned that for, for us. I forgot something, relative. If that whip goes with that bridle, that chest, that whip represents zigzag lightning and straight lightning. It's to motivate a horse on a bad chest. They say, as a Navajo man, don't ever go without that. So as a novel, you should have a horse bridle, a saddle, a rope, and a whip. Then, as a man, you come clean. So you young lady, find that kind of navel, you're going to be all right. (laughs) See, that's what he told me. (laughs) Um, In addition to that, one of the things that we were really focusing on was the concept of teaching and passing along these, not just the, the, the songs, not just the philosophy, but the actual practice and the techniques to make sure that these go through through to our next generations. And we put a call out. We put a call out to the Navajo Nation, and we said, if you have taken a class with Wilson, we want your piece. We want to put it on an in exhibit and we want to put it on display and this is what we got back um his students came back and, and they were excited we have all sorts of pieces in here uh, i believe our oldest piece that we have is a cup made from thomas little ben who's one of our instructors now uh, from 1985 <laughs> and our newest piece we have up there from uh, carlin ami just came off the buffing wheel a couple days ago so you have a whole range of students that, that you'll be able to to take a look at it and each one of them even though we have some really contemporary pieces in there you're going to find a little bit of Wilson in there and so that's what I want I hope that you guys enjoy and because I sure enjoy putting the the exhibit together with with our NCAP staff uh, Cheryl Benali um, our interns that recently just joined on and Rhiannon uh, Rhiannon did an awesome job Rhiannon Sorrell helping to secure the space and and make sure that we make use of the R.C. Gorman library as a as an exhibit hall so thank you guys for coming we have tons of food please help yourself and enjoy the exhibit okay <laughs>